so um, yeah, this is this is great fun. I always love coming. I feel like I'm coming home when I come back. Um, and it's been really great having uh, Jose Carlos revive the virology program here. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing to see the the advancements that uh, we've made since we arrived. And see all of you guys here continuing work on white flies and viruses on the island. So I hope that I hope that continues. Um, yeah, I first came to Puerto Rico in 1990 when Julio Bird was, I think he might have been president of the Caribbean Division of the American Biofast Society and the meeting was held in my address. And I remember flying into the airport, this was long before that new terminal was built, and flying into the airport and getting off the plane on the tarmac and having that humidity and, you know, the tropical odors and, and everything, you know, just, you know, you know, the face. It's, uh, it's just amazing. You know? And it was quite warm, of course, dragging the bags across the tarmac and that sort of thing. You know, but I was actually disappointed the first time when they opened the new American terminal and could get off the plane on the tarmac and walk, you know, walk into the airport. So this won't do. This is how you arrive in Puerto Rico. But now I actually am appreciating it just a little bit more. <laughs> Anyway, um, so um, to try to touch on a number of, of things, uh, people have asked different questions over the last uh, couple of days. And so this presentation I put together is sort of a conglomerate of uh, a couple of different areas in which we've worked to try to focus it in for the interest of the symposium, but also to address, uh, sorry, the workshop on the taxonomy. Um, but also to address some of those questions. I'm going to sort of jump around a little bit, and I did just move things into their positions this morning, so if something's out of position, I'll just say whoops. Um, but I think it's, it's fairly cohesive. So now I know you've been addressing white flies in general, so we're going to have to focus our attention down to a single genus and species. And the reason we're doing that is because this um, this genus and species, Gomesia tabassi, is the best known um, white fly vector of plant viruses. So um, in addition to Gomesia tabassi, the greenhouse white fly is the only other white fly known uh, in the Eurasian So it's So this really is the, um, the group that's of importance. Uh, right? so I call it a group even though it's a genus and species because I tend to think of it as a simple species group. Complex, and there's um, not complete agreement about that. If you read the white fly, the missia, when I say white fly, I'm talking about the missia. If you read the white fly literature, you'll see that some people are convinced that it's the sibling species group. Some people would like to call it separate species. Some people just want to argue to argue um, that there really isn't good um, evidence or good information sufficient to. Um, really argue over it, and until we have more genetic information about this complex, I think that it's really best to think of it as a collective um, group of cryptic uh, individuals that have um, different biological characteristics, uh, and they can be sorted based on uh, molecular uh, genetics tools into, into groups or clades but we still really don't understand how those clades um, are linked to the taxonomy. So just keep an open mind and recognize that we know a lot less than we need to know to really understand um, at the taxonomic level. And so I'm really hoping to hear um, ideas from the group uh, about, about this um, concept and um, sort of what your sense of, of it is. In, in, the context of white flies in general. So, um, we, we daringly call it the Demisia tabassi sibling species group, which actually we proposed in 1995, and um, for the very reason that I'm going to show you today. So, Demisia tabassi um, actually was not initially named, the genus was not Demisia. Um, it was first identified in tobacco testing, colonizing tobacco in Greece by Professor Genadius, who was there at the university. And he named it, um, 
Alarudis, I believe, to Bassett. Um, and that was in 1887, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, fast forward to the you know, around 1914, and um, Corbett, an entomologist, was a U.S. entomologist, identified uh, Bemisia in Florida and called it um, Bemisia to Bassett. Now, not recognizing that it was probably and cousin to the uh, to the species that was identified in, in Greece, and there's a little note in the taxon taxonomy literature that says he didn't um, he didn't include Alarodes tabasi in, in his uh, consideration because the description was inadequate. So he was sort of criticizing Genadius um, for uh, taxonomic description, and so. We, we go through these iterations um, over the next 50 or so years where um, a lot of different species of Bemisia and two others of Alarodes were described by different um, different scientists, different naturalists <clears throat> worldwide. And it became clear that you know, this, this white fly um, occurred worldwide in the subtropics. And in the 19, 1960s, uh, Mound uh, synonymized several of those species into Bemisia tabassi. And then finally, the Alarodes tabassi from Greece was synonymized into genus and species. And Louise Russell in, the, in 1957 then said, well, we might, we might as well add another five or six or seven of these species that are dangling out there because we really can't distinguish them morphologically. And it was the fourth instar. Pupae that the, the quote pupil case that's actually used for morphology because the um, other forms you know, there, there were there were no distinguishing characters that, that were useful and even for the pupil case it seems that that's this the reason I'm telling you this history is because it already it starts out from the very beginning that nobody agrees on what Bemisia tabassi is right and we go from the splitters to the lumpers. And now where we are in history is, I've, I'm the lumper, and I, I like that idea of keeping them together, but people would like to, other people would like to split them back out and call them different species. And what, for what, on what basis, it's not, it's not convincing that we should. So, okay, so um, in general, then, what we know about Pemissi, it's a homopter, and it's a tropical origin. It feeds in the flow. Um, it uses a, a pair of stylets, very slender stylets, to penetrate intercellularly, and that's important if you're a virus because you want to arrive in the phloem inside the cell, and you don't want the white fly to do so much damage that your um, your, your host is, is dead or, or damaged so that you can't uh, multiply and spread. Um, I don't. Is this true about all white flies that they reproduce using the I don't know about all. All of them. Anyway, I, thought, I think this is interesting uh, because the, the, male, the, the males are, are one end, the haploid, and the females are two end. Um, and so basically, um, the males um, uh, arise from unfertilized eggs. So they're really mother minus infertilized. Um, so when you think about um, the genome sequencing that's going on right now, people say, well, should we sequence the males? Sequence the females, you've got half, half the, the employee in the males, which makes it smaller, um, reveal it, but then you miss the alleles be there from the diploid version. So I think what we've arrived at is we're going to just do a mixture of males and females and hope that that's the best strategy. So actually, um, this uh, photograph taken of this white fly, uh, Henry Chesnick, a colleague of mine from Israel, found this in uh, a museum in Stuttgart. He just fell in love with that. He said, this is a white fly that was captured in amber uh, about 130 million years before present. You, if you look at the, the body here, it sort of reminds me more of a psilla than, than a white fly. It's very kind of wide and broad and robust. But apparently this is the first um, or the oldest specimen of, of any white fly that's been preserved or found uh, and preserved in amber. 
So um, the, little, the tree that you see over here on the uh, lower right-hand corner um, is taken from Bruce Campbell. Uh, he, he actually did the very first um, molecular phylogeny of white, of white fly and, and compared relationships between white fly and aphid and that sort of thing. He used the 18S ribosomal RNA gene. Now, that sorts the white fly nicely, you're going to see it from, from other homopterans. But when the, um, it became clear that there were some genetic variants, which perhaps erroneously are fault, perhaps falling in biotypes for lack of a better term to differentiate them, they, they, they have different biological characteristics. Um, sequencing that 18S ribosomal DNA gene showed that there was a single nucleotide difference between the A and the B biotypes. So of course that's not, um, it's not informative and it sort of reinforces that notion that at that level we're talking about the same species. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, most of us tend to think of Bamisia tabassi as a sibling species group. It's been found to adapt, be adapted to a range of ecological niches. So it's sort of plastic. We think of it as being a kind of high, high degree of plasticity. Um, based on molecular markers, mainly the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, we can demonstrate a phylogeographical distribution. And it's helpful because it actually allows you to trace back um, the origins of uh, the extant origins of these because they hop on plants and they move uh, worldwide on plants. And that's how a couple of very important invasive like, haplotypes arrived uh, in different locations in the world and really creating a, a lot of problems, primarily in, in agricultural areas, but also um, they've displaced a lot of the, the local haplotypes, including here in the Caribbean, which I find very sad because um, in terms of biodiversity, I think we really would like to preserve the, the native um, composition. Um, I think we're, we're learning more and more about how maintaining the endemic species helps buffer the system against um, serious uh, serious change and, and imbalances. And it might sound funny, but I um, think that this is the case with viruses too. You have um, situations of virus host coevolution. They learn to live with each other over eons of time. And now you have an invasive virus like tomato yellow leaf curl from the Middle East, which is going to Puerto Rico on tomato, which is Florida here. Um, it, it basically annihilates. It's so it's so virulent and so invasive that it displaces a lot of the native viruses as well. So here, the situation has been displacement of certain of the native viruses, complexes, communities, and plants by TYLCP. It sort of leaves this open space and throws everything out of whack. At the same time, both of the endemic Bamisia tabassi haplotypes um, are probably extinct. Although, about several years before Julio retired, he, he walked from, we went there last year, he walked from his home to a little store in his neighborhood. And he, he found a, a specimen of the CETA biotype um, on a little euphor growing right outside the store. He, for years after the new biotype was introduced, would collect white flies and send them to us in alcohol and we would type them. And it was the first time in 15 years that we turned up that CETA, what he called the CETA race, associated with CETA, CUDA, and a number of the CETA species here, but also colonized bees and all sorts of things. So, um, so it may still be here uh, in the enclaves, but it's, it's certainly not the predominant on the haplotype on the island anymore. Um, in general, um, if you look in the literature, there's a compilation of, of about 480 species of plants that the Missy Tabassi the species group has been associated with. So, that can be a little bit misleading because it's almost a sure thing that every haplotype of the Bassi does not colonize 480 to 500 plants. 
they tend to, to specialize. Some are very, very specialized on single hosts or very closely related hosts, like the Dutropa um, haplotype or biotype here. Um, was there's also evidence in Africa of cassava, I mean, supporting populations that are cassava specific. And there are other examples um, where perhaps they have 20 or 30 hosts. But also, if you rear them in colonies and you ask them to switch to a different species, um, they don't like it much. And if you know, in order to switch them from, say, tomato to pumpkin to a different host, um, you need to put the plant in the cage with them and let them accept it um, over time. Otherwise, the colony will, will die. So, and there are other studies people have done to show that, that they have to make that adjustment. It's not simply a blanket, yes, I feed on 400 and those. So I think that's another example of phenotypic plasticity and this post. Uh, they, can, they can adapt to it, but they, but they need a little bit of time. It's, this is considered the most important um, pest and vector in agricultural crops worldwide. And that's why the white fly and also the viruses have drawn so much attention. And the, the group of viruses transmitted by Bumacea tabassi, the genus is called um, the Goma virus. The, this same species also transmits uh, viruses and a couple of other genera of plant viruses. Um, but only the Goma virus group is transmitted in a circulative manner. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. The symptoms caused by Gemini viruses are relatively distinctive. Um, here in the uh, Caribbean, the term rugaceous uh, disease or rugaceous virus, people are knew that these symptoms were caused by viruses for sure, um, was used. So rugaceous meaning sort of yellowing and curling and crumpling and that sort of thing. And um, it wasn't until 1978 that the family, uh, Gemini Viridae, was erected taxonomically. So until uh, the 1981, it wasn't even clear that they contained single strand circular DNA genomes. So they are still the only group of plant viruses known to contain uh, single strand DNA. So they're sort of unusual. There are examples of these viruses across other, many other kingdoms, in fact. But this is the group that is specific to the plants and also has this vector. So that makes them also very interesting to the virology community. Okay, so one of the things you can see, um, if you, if you start, tra trace through the literature, you can, you can see when um, the gomo viruses and white fly outbreaks occur. So when there aren't any problems, the literature um, is making, right? There's no reports. When when you have outbreaks and places upsurges and for good white fly years, you start to see the literature fill up with that kind of information. And so it's actually a very the virus literature is actually a really good body of literature to use to, to track um, white fly upsurges right, worldwide. So um, I mentioned already uh, narrow to broad host range uh, is is recognized. Um, these are the kinds of symptoms uh, that Gemini viruses cause in, in plants. This is the we have the lacquers that's taken here in Puerto Rico, tomato, um, Dutropa. So this is the Dutropa mosaic virus that was transmitted uh, by the D biotype into the passion vine. This is also from Puerto Rico uh, when the bee was introduced. This is Macroptilium. This is also from, from here. See this bright yellow sort of um, uh, modeling, um, that's, that's where that name rugaceous comes from. And there's Jotropha mosaic right down here. Um, this is from Puerto Rico. Here's cotton and then uh, squash, one of the squash leaf curl virus from uh, Arizona. So quite a diverse range of symptoms, but they share in common the, the color uh, and uh, foliar uh, distortion, that sort of thing. And in addition, uh, in cotton, you'll notice this little leaflet right here on the underside. That's an, it's called an enation. And the viruses also in certain, certain hosts and certain of the Pagoma viruses will cause that kind of outgrowth on the underside of the face. It's a very um, hypertrophy because of the study. Pathology, no 
so it's, it disturbs the hormone balance in the plant. And they, they don't all do that, but this one in cotton in particular does. So I mentioned the first outbreak um, or notice of Bumisia tabassi in 1889. In the early 1900s, uh, the, uh, people started paying attention to uh, the diseases uh, showing these sort of brilliant symptoms uh, in, in Brazil. So this was studied by Bauer and then later Silberschmidt and a number of people that followed, including some uh, very excellent um, microscopists who's still um, in Campinas. He's in Campinas, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so time went on and, and people began to you know, report um, these, these symptoms, but mainly um, they were associated with not with crop species, but when they were, it would be tomato or soybean, that sort of thing. Um, but, but mainly they were just so interesting because of the type of symptom that they caused, and they were associated with white fly. It, it, it became an, an area, an important area of study uh, in Brazil. And then there was an enclave of researchers in Central America and also uh, Julio Bird here in Puerto Rico. When he came back from doing his PhD in Minnesota, um, 1949, we started working on these uh, interesting uh, virus-like organisms. As I mentioned, it wasn't until the 70s that we they were classified as, as viruses. And any of you know who Bob Goodman is? He apparently has relatives here, uh, I think in, yeah, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, Julio recognized that the, these viruses were something unusual, but didn't have the resources for them really here to, to pursue them at a level that he wanted to. So Bob Goodman would pass through frequently on his way to visit his relatives here. And one of the times uh, he was here, Julio had some bean plants that were symptomatic and infected with what he thought to be this type of virus, which became actually the type virus for the Vigoma viruses, which is where that name comes from, being golden mosaic, so P-E-G-O-M-O, by the genes is called Vigoma virus. He gave the material to Bob Goodman and he said, take this back to Champaign Urbana, characterize this virus as going to be a new group. And Bob Goodman did that, and it was his work published in 1981 that showed um, that it was a single strand of DNA virus. And, um, You'll notice if you scan the literature that Julio is a, a, a co-author on some of those early papers as well. Um, in the 1950s, the, early, the first reports are coming from the southwestern U.S. of white fly transmitted viruses, and cotton was the first crop to be affected. Um, this is not right. This should be 18, 15, not 14. Um, in 1993, uh, working with Julio, we found that this this uh, symptom in Jotropha was caused by, I'm sorry, in passion, it was caused by Jotropha mosaic virus. Um, Julio's, another contribution he made was his keen obs observations about the host range of Tabassi here. And he, he, he did a lot of um, greenhouse work and transferred light flaws and did transmission studies and that was sort of uh, characterization kind of work. And what he found was the white fly associated with this Jotropha folia would not transfer to uh, any of the other uh, species. But he referred to it as um, a host race or um, the Jotropha race of uh, the Missia. Whereas um, on Cita species, and actually quite a large number of additional species, including bean, etc. Um, he found the population had a very broad distribution to transfer. So he referred to that as the Cita race. And that was what um, I found very intriguing um, when uh, I started my PhD in Arizona in 1981. I told my major professor that I wanted to work on the vector uh, problem. So I just been working on Barley Willard work in Athens, my master's. And he said, well, we didn't really have uh, any problems except aphid transmitted proteviruses and pepper, and I said, oh, that's work on that. 
And about a week later, um, there was this enormous outbreak of white fly and virus in um, oh, about four hours' drive south of Tucson along the Colorado River, where we have a lot of vegetable production uh, in Arizona. And um, it was it was basically across the entire valley. There were symptoms in every crop, in lettuce, in uh, cucurbits. And it's, it's a big, big vegetable area. And my major professor was in Washington, D.C. at the time of the meeting. He flew home early. Um, and he, he had a friend who uh, was a pilot, had a pilot's license to fly a Cessna, those tiny planes. Now, this was August, and I had just arrived in, in Tucson, so I wasn't acclimated yet to that temperature. And you guys know in Yuma, Arizona, temperatures can reach as high as 25 in the summertime. And this was the summertime. So we got on that little plane. Have you ever flown a little plane like that with that heat coming off the off the earth in the afternoon in the, in the late morning? That plane was like this the entire time. And and there's not a lot of space in those planes, so I was sitting facing my major professor and the seat right in the pilot was up front. And we both kept talking to each other. We've done this before because we thought we would probably throw up if we didn't talk. So we had this, we were shouting at each other flying, and the plane was like this, and when we got to Yuma, they, they came out on the tarmac of the, the cars and met us, and I took like one step down on those, you know, like two steps that unfold, and I, I didn't realize, but my legs, it was like having gummy legs, and I didn't realize the stress from, from that flight was, had been so severe. Well, they, yeah, they caught me and put me in the car. Anyway, we went out to the fields. It's the only time in my life I've ever seen um, adults standing out in the sun in Yuma uh, at noon in August in 122 degree weather. There were more people there than I even knew you know, lived in Yuma. Everyone was, was out just to see this problem. And so um, Merritt Nelson went walking around the village, you know, and I had done, um, went, just went and started looking at the, in the fields and turning leaves over, and that they were absolutely white, with white flies, absolutely white. And before we flew down, Mer I had um, talked with the extension agent on the phone because Merit was out of town, and I said, do you see any insects in the field? And um, he said, no, maybe a few leaf hoppers. There, there was no precedent for white fly to be in vegetable crops until that time. Remember I said cotton, 1954, white fly, the was only known in cotton and only known to transmit leaf crumple at the time. So I had given a seminar on Gemini viruses for my master's um, seminar in Washington when I was finishing my, my, my master's degree. My major professor assigned me a seminar um, on that group of viruses because it had just been named. So I had done a lot of reading and discovered the work that Julio Bird had done here and others, uh, Silver, Silver Schmidt, etc., in Brazil. And I had read a lot about white flies and about these symptoms. And if, if I had not done that seminar, I would not have recognized white fly and I wouldn't have recognized the symptoms. So, Merrick came over to me, and he was sort of nervous because he, he didn't know what, what was going on. He needed to, to give them uh, an answer. And he said, what do you think? And I said, these are white flies. And he went over, and of course, he was the hero telling everybody this was a, a brand new uh, group of viruses and white fly transmission for the first time. So then, before he left, he said, OK, good. And then he goes, I guess you have a project. <laughs> so that's how I started working on white It's a long story. But it's, you know, it's, 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 you see the literature now and you follow that and just look at these dates that start popping out. And every one of these dates is associated with some kind of change that occurred um, in, in different agricultural systems. And you see the time span here is the time over which agriculture was expanding into monoculture, production under irrigation, right? Irrigation systems were being built all over the world. Before that, you had to rely on, on rainfall, and you didn't grow food when there wasn't um, rain. So basically, Pumicia tabassi does very well with us in our agricultural systems. Um, we've 
more or less created the problems that, that we deal with, but that's, we're pretty good at that. Humans are good at creating problems and also at solving them, and sometimes having unintended consequences. But in the course of um, following uh, the history of this thing and being involved in it since 1980, um, it's, just, it's been a fascinating field from the standpoint of science, but also to the detective work and, and, and the um, you know, sort of linking of this new virus group with also a, um, a white fly vector that was poorly studied to that point in which once that can of worms was opened in terms of um, what was it? I mean, we're still years later, not clear uh, on the taxonomy. So I hope you guys from your workshop have come up with some words of wisdom as to how to, how to deal with this. Um, but if not today, maybe, uh, maybe in time. Um, better speed up here. So this concept of um, host races that Julio proposed um, was extended by one um, group working in uh, Brazil who recognized that, um, that Vermicia Tabassi in Brazil did not colonize Saba there. So this was a connection to this host idea. I don't think it was anywhere near as powerful as what Julio discovered here, but it was kind of a, in fact, it was Louise Russell that co-published uh, the Brazilians on, on that to, to demonstrate that Saba was not colonized by Tabassi, so you're probably asking, so what? Saba was taken uh, to Africa three different times in the history of um, Africa to each of the, uh, around the Horn and, and up each side was taken there and given to the people to grow as a staple crop. Where's, where's cassava from? Where's the origin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the significance is that in South America, where cassava is endemic, the Missy of Tabassi there did not colonize it. But when it was introduced into um, Africa, it was colonized by the Missy of Tabassi and became infected with African cassava virus, which is, had never seen cassava before. So another example of an outbreak that occurred as a change that we made to the cropping system. Anyhow, these kinds of phenotypes or biological sets of biological characters um, drew attention, uh, uh, drew the attention of, of a lot of entomologists and pathologists, etc., virologists, and we needed a, a word to refer to them. Um, and for lack of a better word, we borrowed from the aphid literature and, and called them biological types. Julio called them host races, but we didn't always have a host um, evidence that the host was necessarily the only important phenotype. So people began to study this and began to realize that uh, there were a number of behavioral and genetic differences, including um, insecticide resistance, which was a big one, of course, because of agriculture. And seemed that there was uh, it was very dynamic in terms of its ability of certain populations to develop resistance to certain plus insecticides and others not. But so some of these some of these recognized uh, phenotypes were um, uh, host range. We already talked about that. Either monophagous or relatively narrow versus highly polyphagous. That's many many hosts. Also, there was evidence in virus vector relationships varied in that. Um, the competency of transmission uh, could, could be demonstrated to uh, be related to how long the virus and vector had been in contact with each other. So sort of a co-evolution. Um, those are subtle um, kinds of characteristics to measure, but it was, it was done. Um, also, fecundity uh, is quite variable. For example, the Jatropha uh, race but only a little positive about 30 eggs in its lifetime. Whereas the cedar race was around 100. And the B biotype, which is this invasive type that's now uh, spread everywhere, can, can lay over 300 eggs in its lifetime. So a huge variation in fecundity um, as well. Um, and then, of course, um, we, we know that they carry endosymbionts, these bacterial endosymbionts that contribute um, to uh, amino acid, they synthesize amino acids that are in short supply or absent in the clone that the white blood absolutely need. 
and more, much more work has been done on that in the last 30 years, and we now recognize that there are multiple kinds of endosymbionts, and the symbionts seem to contribute to varying degrees of fitness and uh, parasitoid attack, that sort of thing, um, nutrition, that sort of thing. So, so many people think that the endosymbionts are actually drivers of a lot of this plasticity, and perhaps uh, I think there's some good evidence for at least that in certain cases. And then, of course, we wanted to understand them in terms of genetics. And so early on, um, the tools that were available uh, first looked to look for differences in proteins. Um, so uh, when the what we now call the bee biotype was introduced into the US, um, it was introduced on poinsettia. It's also introduced into Puerto Rico on poinsettia. Um, we said, well, it looks like they have different host strain. We characterized it, compared it to the type that was in Arizona in cotton and vegetables. And um, Heather Costa uh, did this work with me. Um, you notice what year this is. This is the year um, after Julio Bird invited us to the Caribbean Division meeting. Heather and I came down and presented our work on this new biotype, um, having been introduced into the States. And we found it here as well. Um, what's important here is that we were using the protein or differences in protein migration. Um, these are esterases uh, to differentiate them genetically. This is probably considered fairly primitive now because we have DNA sequences. But what we were able to show is is that there were definitely distinct patterns here. You might notice that this gel is backwards. You see that the A B. I'm leaving it like that because. Uh, when we made our poster for the APS meeting, we um, were in a sort of up late one night finishing. Remember posters, you used to have to actually put them together. There was no PowerPoint. Anything. And so we accidentally printed the photograph in the wrong direction. We didn't have time to redo it. So it went on the poster like that. So I kept it that in that direction. Now, A and B. Many people don't realize why we call the B biotype what it is, or the A what it is. The A is, is the endemic one, the southwestern U.S. and part of Mexico, northwest Mexico, is, is because when Heather labeled these, the gel, she just labeled the lanes A and B. And she didn't use A because that was the Arizona sample. She just labeled A and B. I would have probably used one and two. I don't know why she did A and B. Um, Anyway, so we just said, well, OK, we see this A pattern, and we see this B kind of pattern. And that evolved into, well, OK, I guess it's the A biotype and the B biotype. And so as we um, then went on to study populations from different locations, this is Ramon Laster's colony from Costa Rica. It's not C because it's from Costa Rica. It just was the third one we looked at. So so as we, this is Nicaragua. So as we. Um, collected samples, we were able to show that there were a lot of polymorphisms at the protein level in, in these different populations from different locations. We also were able to show, that, here's the A pattern here, that in many locations now, you can see these, these numbers, they start around 1990 and, and go this way. All of these are B biotypes that are found in many different locations worldwide as it was being distributed and invading uh, in cropping areas. So this gave us a way to, to track it, to understand a bit more about, um, about the, what was happening in terms of these outbreaks. Um, but it, in the end, it, was, um, it just showed us that there was a lot more genetic variation than what uh, people had expected. Um, but it didn't allow us to really look at, um, at the level of genetics that would have allowed us to um, uh, say draw a tree and show relationships. There. So, so about this time, it was possible to um, do PCR. The dark ages were ending, and PCR was coming into into play. So they said, "Well, we've got to we've got to um, do DNA sequencing for this thing." So this is the cytochromopsis, this little cartoon of the cytochromopsis one gene. Um, here's the end two here. Here's the end of the gene through the end, and the code two over here. So Chris Simon and a group of um, molecular uh, entomologists interested really in studying taxonomy at the molecular level for non-agricultural important plants. 
developed a set of um, some sets of primers that would amplify this region for different groups of, of insects. And she was giving a seminar at the U of A, um, and I went to talk to her afterwards and asked her if she could recommend the best set for us to, to try. And so we did, and we absolutely had you know, great success. So this is the region that I was telling you guys about. It's from here in about 850 bases. Now, those of you who've been following the Universal Barcode project, um, for whatever reason, this end of the gene has been selected for the barcode project. So um, we call those the Fulmer primers to distinguish from those that we've been using. But what happened is we started working on this years before that project started. So if you go to GenBank now, you'll see that all, almost all the sequences for whitefly, and mostly their promiscuous tabaxi, um, are actually of the opposite end of that gene. So the reference sequences that you want to use to compare your own um, to understand the relationships are not the former region, but the southern, southern end of the gene. Um, we recently tested the former primers on a subset of samples, so we had a reference set. And we found that the former primers amplified slightly more samples um, than the NT1012 primers, we call them. But the divergence of the region is greater by climbing into the gene than it is at the former region. So um, I'll show you in a minute why that's probably not that important. Um, but it's interesting. So this is one of the first trees that we developed with our cytochrome oxidase 1 gene um, sequences. And we just kept those letter designations for the, for the uh, collections. So what you see um, here is, so just to orient you, so here's the bee biotype here. And if you look at the different locations where the bee is found, you can, you can conclude after you look at the distribution of the other haplotypes that this bee is an invasive type because it's not found in, it's not only found where its uh, origin is, it's found all over. So we were able to show that, to corroborate the protein polymorphisms and every, all of the uh, samples that have that B biotype uh, protein band are now falling in this plate right here. Now, this is now known as the Q plate. This, this Q on our, our, our set of protein polymorphisms was a population from Spain. And it, there was an upsurgence in the tomato and melon producing area in Spain. And that one, um, so we ended up studying that one. Um, you'll notice here, here's Morocco, Sudan, Spain, uh, Turkey. So this, where's this? This is the Mediterranean, right? So here's Q-like. Um, and then over here, we start to see, so this, this is a very small sample size for Africa. And Africa blows up into uh, an amazing um, degree of diversity uh, when you look at it. It's, it's probably its, it's center of origin for, uh, for white flag. We, or for Bemisia. We sort of thought, oh, is it sort of an out of Africa Bemisia to the SE idea because maybe it, maybe it actually followed people. Maybe it actually, we know how well it does with people. Um, but there's a, I mean, that's just sort of a, a whimsical way to think about it, but agriculture, people, Bemisia. Um, but, but basically, it's, I mean, the diversity is huge there. And then here are some of our New World samples. Here's Juliocida and Jutropha here from the Caribbean. Here's from Bolivia. So this is our only South American on here. Here's Culiacan and here's uh, the Arizona one. So, but you can see that I mean, these are very closely related. So the Americas, there's the least amount of diversity uh, in the Americas compared to anywhere else. And then in Asia, we see sort of two major groups, um, China, Pakistan, Thailand, Malaysia. And you see there's an overlap uh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, etc. And then Uganda, this is actually maybe not even a permissible fasci, I'm not sure. The sweet potato. This one always is an outlier. It's one I'd like you to look at, actually. Some specimens, if you can distinguish it in. But it also could just be an example of this continuum, you know. 
Okay, so that kind of that gave us some good sense of the sort of phylogeographical distribution of the white fly, and it showed that the bee was out of place. Uh, it, was, it was far away from home. Um, I think I was telling this yesterday. The um, APHIS uh, group that does exploration um, for parasitoids, for biological control, um, they were they were sent out when the bee biotech was uh, had invaded, and they were sent out to try to find natural enemies that would control it. And they naturally went to um, India, once had the reputation of being the um, center of diversity for Vermicius tabaxi. Um, I, I believe it's um, it's Africa, but it was thought to be India because so many records were from India, so it was skewed in terms of um, people's perception of it. So that was that was the dogma in the literature. So they went to India to collect, and they also um, went to Central America. To when we were able to show um, that the bee biotech is not on here, but some of our reference populations were from the Arabian Peninsula and from uh, northeast Africa. And on one of our early trees, we were able to show that the bee biotech actually hailed from that part of the world. And when we produced that tree and, and showed it to them, they were able to say, oh, they were looking at the wrong locations for for the parasitoids coming from people over the Arabian Peninsula uh, and North Africa. And two of those parasitoids that were brought into Mission, Texas, and they were in Rio Grande Valley uh, were, were fairly successful. They used a climate matching approach and could show that one of them would be quite well in Rio Grande Valley, where it was a bit more humid. Another one did pretty well in Arizona, where it was growing on. So just sort of shows the power of being able to use the Phylogeny to you know, predictions about um, natural enemy coevolution. Okay, so so I mentioned that the uh, the uh, cytochrome oxidase one gene is more divergent at that MT1012 end of the gene, and this is a fairly small sample size, but it does show you, and it's maybe quite astounding how divergent uh, it is. Um, so our New World uh, populations have the least. Um, um, divergence between zero and about, it's actually less than 8.6, it's actually around less than four as we have more, have more specimens. Indian subcontinent is high as 17%, um, Africa, Middle East, Mediterranean, played with the, in the QR and, and the rest, it's, it's this part of it's, um, this, this area that actually gives the diversity uh, up to about 18%. And then in sub-Saharan, this is a fairly small sample size. A lot of these were coming from cassava at the time. So it looks very low. Um, but when you look at outside of cassava, you see that it's as high as almost 20%. And this is a comparison of the greenhouse white fly and all tabasis between 24 and 28. So that's, that's, there's a lot of divergence in, in that short sequence. And that's what allows us to visualize it visualize them phylogenetically and separate them into groups. Now, this kind of information is what made a lot of people say, oh, there's more than one species. But I was reminded yesterday that within the genus and species of E. coli, there's 40% divergence across the entire, I mean, look at the entire genome sequence, E. coli. So does that logically make us believe that we can say that there are many species just because divergence within an 800 base pair fragment of one gene of a mitochondria <laughs> can be as high as 24%. You guys can answer that. Okay, so this then looking at um, many, 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 many more sequences and using a bit more sophisticated uh, approach, this is Bayesian analysis, uh, we get. Um, some nice separation here. Those of you who um, know this method recognize that these posterior probabilities have to be collapsed if they're less than 95%. So it's not the same as um, those values are not uh, bootstrap values. Those are not, so you, you can live with 70% bootstrap um, at your nodes and feel confident of that. But when you, in Bayesian analysis, it's like statistical 
uh, analyses where you really would like to have 99%. If you slip down to 95, you can live with it, but you're not really happy about being enrolled in 95%. So we retain this, but actually to publish it, we would not, we would remove these numbers because they're not significant. So when you do that, what happens to that tree? Even here, it's questionable. This is our 100% here. 100% here for the new world, and plus there's 95% we can accept for half. But the rest of the tree is unresolved. How many species do we have on that tree? Did anyone hazard a guess? Now, I don't know the answer. I still think it's one. Because we can't distinguish it. I should tell you if you go and, and read the um, paper that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> I was going to put a slide in to show their tree. Um, the group from Australia has decided that they want to be the splitters. They want to, uh, they, the Paul de Barros group and the Chinese group that they he works closely with have decided that there are 22 species of the Messia tabassi among the collection that they amassed. And they're pretty proud of the fact that they've done mating studies. I think it's actually cool. So it shouldn't be sarcastic. They, but they've kind of overblown their conclusions, in my opinion. But they've done mating studies with these, a number of different populations and shown that there's no mating, no gene flow between any of the groups. Now, on the other hand, we've done mating studies between the B, A, and the Tropha and shown mating in all directions, but a block in, um, uh, in, in direction when a Wabakia or a Cardinium was present, which these are these little reproductive endosins. And so um, it's curious that people get different results with under different conditions and different hosts, but at the moment, everyone seems completely convinced that, that those, are, um, those results are valid, and they very well may be. I mean, I think it's very clear that this group is either has speciated or is in the process of speciating. There just simply aren't any morphological characters yet that can be used to definitively corroborate uh, uh, that, uh, that hypothesis. But gene flow certainly um, cannot be equal between all tabassi. And at some point in time, I'm sure isolation has, has resulted that um, has arrested gene flow. But remember that the idea behind sibling species groups is that, just imagine you have three groups, A, B, and C. If you say this is a, this is a sibling species group, then A can mate with B, A can't mate with C, but C can mate with B, there's gene flow between A, B, and C, right? So now stretch that out to however many different haplotypes and Patients, etc. Surely there's going to be some that continue to interact with each other, and others that probably uh, are isolated. And I think that's what we're seeing. That's kind of what we're capturing. This sort of evolution as it's happening. Um, and so, do we argue about it? Or <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's a way cool phenomenon to be studying because once you have morphological characters to separate, things, that's it tells you that it's a complete, it's, it's done, it's a done deal. But I think we're seeing this as it's happening. Okay. And so this is sort of my version of the six major clades, and I'm not really sure we can say South America, but uh, we have the Bolivia that we have, and we have a couple of other specimens from here are seem to be somewhat divergent from this group here in the, in the north and central. American and Caribbean. Unfortunately, there's almost no specimens from South America. They, they, just, they just want the material out of the they do rapids or some other kind of analysis. You can't compare without references. But um, hopefully, we're, we're working in Ecuador right now, and hopefully we'll have some specimens from there. Uh, but you, you see the other groups, they're, they're fairly clear. You have this um, Asian one type play from the tree sort of here in the Pacific with Australia and you've got this kind of overlap here in Asia and this group. And then here's the 
this is Africa, so we have Sub-Saharan. We have a sort of a southern group, a western group, and then this North Africa, Middle East, um, Mediterranean group here, which is where that B and Q type, those, those groups are. And then we have also some bee-like populations here coming down the Arabian Peninsula and all the way down the coast of, um, of Africa and down through the Union Island in here. So, um, and those, although they fall in the bee-like clade, that's not an area where, uh, along the, the coast of, of Africa there, that's not hot and dry. That's not, that's not arid in the way we recognize the areas where the bee biotype has established and done very, very well. So there's, um, we've done some work with George Roderick and his graduate student, uh, Margarita Pagestili, looking, uh, using um, uh, microsatellites to look at those populations. And when you do that, you see that there's a lot of variability within members that type into the B-type clade by the pro one. So it's not straightforward and simple in a single genetic type. And that's true about that Q-type clade as well. So the esterase profiles in the colon sequences are pretty limiting, but you know, they give us clues that they're still very limited in telling us uh, anything about the genetics or the extent of gene flow. Um, microsatellite markers are giving some good evidence that there's gene flow between um, Q-like and between B-like. Um, but doesn't look like between Q and B. They overlap. Maybe there's isolation between them, say, not at the same location. Okay, I'm going to keep going here. So, uh, just wanted to kind of drive home. I think I mentioned before that the uh, the gummel viruses are the circulatively transmitted group of viruses, whereas those other two genera that I pointed to that are transmitted by Bermisia, those are, those are transmitted in a non-persistent or a semi-persistent manner. And what that means is viruses does not enter the body itself. It's in either the mouth parts or the foregut. There it's transmitted back to the plant. But the gummal viruses have this, um, I would say, much more intimate relationship with the vector. This is some work that we did in our lab in Joe Cicero. Nice job on this colloidal home labeling. And this shows where you see these, this dark area. This is localizing squash and coronavirus to salivary glands. And also, to, to the, this is the mid gut. And the model that we use is similar to that um, that we invoke based on the luteal virus system, where it circulates, it's not taken, the virus is taken in through the mouth parts, of course, and into the gut. And at some location in the gut, and for the, the gonal viruses, it's the mid gut, virus crosses that mid gut barrier gets into the blood and then it travels to the salivary glands and from there it's transmitted. So, um, is that an, uh, a character that we could also rely on among other, uh, say, a group of characters to say, well, the gomal viruses recognize Promisia tabasi as Promisia tabasi as Promisia tabasi. That degree of coevolution, that specificity that we have in that only Bermisia tabasi transmits the gonal viruses, does that tell us anything about the genetics of, of the sibling species group? The viruses certainly um, recognize Bermisia tabasi as, as such, right? The endosymbionts, the primary endosymbiont, is exactly the same in all of the Bermisia. Um, so, you know, if you think about multiple characters, when you have a problem like this to try to understand this kind of an insect, it's probably important to look at multiple multiple characters as well as multiple genes. So, anyway, I'm saying that the viruses are telling us that we're on the right track, seeing this as a co-evolved um, situation between them and their vector. More close-ups. I just put these in because I think they're beautiful. This is really nice work that Joe did labeling. Okay. Do I keep going? Or are you guys tired? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, uh, mm -hmm. 
Sure. This is the part I really, really wanted to spend, spend some time on for you guys. But then, Ian, you asked me about um, the other viruses. So within the Gemini Viridae, um, they're, uh, they're, they, they're separated by vector uh, and um, also by, by host, so dicots or monocots. And originally, until just this last uh, couple of years, there were only four uh, quote groups, four genera in the Gemini Veridae, but since that time, um, we now recognize uh, almost, well, there's two more that have not been confirmed, but uh, there's probably going to end up being at least seven or eight genera here. And of these, these are leaf hopper transmitted the viruses. This is a tree hopper. This is leaf hopper. We don't know the vectors for these two groups yet. These are both um, Promethea tabasi the old world and new world gigoma viruses. Um, this is this group of monopartite viruses that I think is going to become a new genus called sweepoviruses that um, are traveling around in uh, sweet potato. And also we found them here for the first time in Moremia and, and related Convolvulaceae plants. Some of those were um, uh, viruses that we were characterized by transmission years and years ago. We didn't know that they had a single component genome. Uh, just a few years ago. So it's looking like they're probably going to be a separate genus. They're transmitted by Vemisia tabasi too. So now we have two genera, putative genera within this, this family that are transmitted by Vemisia tabasi. And this just shows the evidence for a probable uh, uh, corroborating the uh, hypothesis that they're completely different from a monophyletic group. But notice how similar they are to each other. There's almost no variability within that, so those are probably a single species, even though they're representing many, many different samples from, from different posts. So up here we have white fly transmitted, white fly transmitted, and then hoppers, uh, plant hoppers and hoppers. Is that what you wanted to know? <laughs> OK. So this is an example of symptoms of these this is the Cagellina. This is a big problem. They streak in, um, in maize in, in Africa. Maize was taken there from the New World as well. Here's a virus that's a problem. Uh, that's curly top. That's a uh, dicot infecting. Here's the bean golden mosaic virus symptoms. Uh, the, the right, the yellow type side is the susceptible variety. This is the type virus, and it was first identified here in Puerto Rico. And this was a map that I put together in 19. 92, I believe, of, and this was the sum total of the GOMO viruses that had been discovered and named and either partially or completely sequenced. Um, if I were to superimpose on that map today the number of sequences and species that, uh, for which sequences are available in GenBank, it would obliterate the map. There are um, almost 750 species that have been identified in the last 30 years, and there's many, many more out there. So they are also uh, a great, they're, they're a group of viruses that a lot of people enjoy working on because they're, they're so different. Oh, this is this is the tree then that sort of simplifies. Um, and it does show you that there are many more Begoma viruses described. Again, it's only a, a portion, but there's the new world and old world Begoma viruses up at the top. You see the corrosion down here, you see the new streak. And, so that's a bit of a simplified tree to help you grasp the connection between geography, um, the virus, the vector species, the host, and the genus. Um, OK, here's what I want to show you. Um, this is uh, some of the work that we've done with these monopartite uh, genomes. So let me see if I can quickly. So the, Old world Gagoma viruses, one brown box, those genomes can either be um, packaged in one particle, which are called monopartite, or they have two genome, two um, partial genomes called A and B, not A and B biotype, but in separate, uh, separate particles. It takes these two A and B to make, get an infection. But it, the other type of arrangement is a, is a monopartite. And so far, the monopartite types are not known in the Americas or the Caribbean. So when we found um, these monopartite genomes in Moremia here, 
people said, oh, well, they must have been brought here from Asia or Africa because they don't exist here. Well, now I just showed you that they're probably a different genus. But previously, people lumped them in with the Begoma viruses because they were white fly transmitted. But now we can, we can see clearly that they're, they're divergent enough that we can't be considering you know, Begoma viruses. But what's really fun about this is that they've been sitting here all this time uh, in the Caribbean. And we also know they're now, we found them in Guatemala. Um, and this, this picture is taken by Julio, actually. That's the Moremia mosaic virus that um, he described uh, years ago. And until um, we did the analysis on it, we didn't know that it was monopartite. So I just want to show you. Um, we, we found it in tomato as a pathogen in tomato after the new biotype was introduced. So that tells you that you know it can come out of the native, the native host and move into a crop. Um, to our surprise, we found a bipartite and a monopartite virus in that tomato plant. And one of them has a, was a match to the virus we previously found about seven years before in Moremia. So here was, here was an example of, of the virus being able to make um, this jump as long as the vector could, uh, could feed on the plant. But that's really simple. OK, so here's kind of a, these are close up of the, of the uh, photographs. Um, this one is just an enlargement of the one I just showed you in the tomato. So there's an asymptomatic moremia up here. You couldn't find virus in that. So we know that there are at least some of these that are, are not infected here on the island. And we've done a survey around the island, and it, these, these types of viruses are found everywhere on the island. So it doesn't seem that it's just as simple, but here it was introduced in this one location. Okay. Now, you might have noticed on the first slide I made a connection to sweet potato. These viruses were first found in sweet potato. Sweet potato being vegetatively propagated. Once it's infected, it will harbor the virus. Sweet potato has been taken to Africa, to the Mediterranean. Uh, there's I think, recent evidence that Polynesians did about 1,000 years ago take sweet potato uh, to Polynesia, from probably from South America. Um, and so now think about this, these viruses riding around in sweet potato. Um, sweet potato comes from. Where's sweet potato from? It could. Hmm? Peru's one center of, of the Caribbean also is, is a possible center. So it's 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 kind of a, it's probably the, the region. Um, so it's probably not surprising, is it, that the sweet potato is carrying the virus that it probably is native here and carried it around the world, but. These viruses, I don't believe they're introduced. I think, I think they're endemic here. And that they are probably a separate genus doesn't conflict with people's concern that there were no monopartite gagoma viruses found in the New World previously. This is just a virology thing, but it's, I think it's, it's really interesting. And they're right here in your backyard. So we did coax postulates with this. We made infectious clones and inoculated or any plants to show that we could transmit. And we also, um, and, and others have shown, this is the demonstration of the monopartite genome uh, for the first time. But we also found that they're very difficult to transmit with the white fly with the B biotype, since that's the only one that we still have in culture. But now think about that. Is that does that give us proof that they're not white fly transmitted? Where's the B biotype from? It's not from the Caribbean. If we have the cedar rays, I think we get asked the question, can the cedar rays transmit these viruses um, between um, Remy? Um, there's very, very low transmissibility by the B biotype from sweet potato to sweet potato down in one mile. So there is evidence that they're white fly transmit, but with difficulty. Sometimes when viruses are um, retained in a vegetatively propagated host, they lose their ability to be vector transmitted. So maybe the sweet potato. Um, uh, occupying uh, viruses are they maybe are poorly transmissible for that reason. But if they had to see their face, we could try to transmit this thing between Moremia and Moremia and ask if um, we have a Because it's definitely moving somehow. Now, whether it's still moving with the B biotype having inundated the island, I don't know. Fortunately, these you know, Moremia um, continue to grow. They're, they're 
subfitessin, and so they continue to grow year after year. But whether we're, we're actually seeing continuous spread in the absence of it, or maybe in the enclaves where the CETA is still, the CETA race is still maybe hiding out and they're causing some spread. But I think that's a good example of the, um, you know, the disturbance that's been caused by the B biotype and, and really um, you know, changing the landscape uh, here as, as a result of that. Okay, so I just wanted to show you infectivity on tobaccos and infectivity in sweet potato. So we know we can we can cause infection with inoculated using the gene gun. And I'll just go quickly. We can show that there's quite a bit of recombination in these viruses, and that um that can also cause some confusion in the taxonomy because the combined regions might have a different history than the non combined regions sort of thing. And we can find that there's some hot spots where the recombination occurs, uh, especially in the uh, coat protein. And so this was just, just sort of a final look at if we remove those regions of recombination versus the complete genome. This is the complete genome. See what a mess it is. Now remember, this is probably all one species. But if we remove those regions of recombination, we see a much more uh, defined picture of the family tree. Um, but basically showing um, how those recombined sequences can really wreak havoc in your phylogenetic tree. That's what happens when you have new mites in your mito too. You'll see things aren't exactly the way they should be. OK, so this is the. The last slide I already showed you this just to come back to it. That these are probably this monopartite group right here is probably going to be considered a, a new genus. And it's the second group now then that would be as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions and comments uh, with just like a hand up there. Five minutes for that, and we have several activities to conclude and uh, workshop. Thank you. Appreciate very much, and uh, I think that brings uh, a nice close in terms of our discussion about the importance of the group. Just a, a, a little question mm -hmm. How many viruses do we know transmitted by white fly? That not the missing. So the the Ipomo viruses are transmitted by um, the missing but in a non-persistent or semi-persistent semi-persistent manner. Mm -hmm. um, Trial rodents and greenhouse mm -hmm. transmits some prey viruses. Um, the missing is pretty specific to the Jemmy viruses in terms of the circular transmission. Okay. One other group, um, some body viruses are transmitted by these, but non persistent. Mm -hmm. means the no feature is that the majority of no virus transmitted are due by uh, genes or species, where we have thousands of white flies. That, uh, we don't that, know. that are not known to, to transmit. To transmit. Yeah, they're just not known. It, it, it may be that they are yeah. they are vectors of other other kinds of viruses. And you know, I think I asked asking yesterday, what's the that was this morning, what's the um, percent of um, insects that, which taxonomy is not been resolved or named and named, etc. I mean, viruses are just, we. There are many, many more than you know. Okay. I'm not really cool genomes and different kinds of viruses. Aren't even aware of. <coughs> you pointed out on the perhaps that you know uh, Australia and uh, is it yeah it was very lacking in that 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 the circular biotype. Do that. You know, what, and who is invading in that area? Is it, the bee is there. The bee is there. Yeah. But it's just that the representation of diversity is very low. It's interesting because that's not how you look at New Zealand. Not New Zealand. 
from the beginning. You know, that area is so diverse. Well, we have no samples from there, and I would expect that it might it, it might actually be a gold mine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Australia, there's two, there were two endemic haplotypes found in Nickel and Nickel and Nickel and I was going to say the white fly individual um, have multiple virus types. Yes. Yes, and they can even they can even harbor and transmit two different chromosome viruses. At the same time. And that is that type of all true of all groups. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's only been studied for a few. But you mean in the so virus P can have a lot oh, of them, or well, most of the work's been done. That's so one that's pretty much every important factor in being maintained in following. And a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these have to be fixed. You can't be fixed. You can't be fixed. You can't be fixed. You just won't. Oh, wow. That's why when people will talk about this stuff, you know, Pomitsi, uh, Tabassi, they really must be able to study the biotech and the open. The biotech and the open for the southwest journey. We also knew we hardly know anything about it. But there's some um, estrates patterns that you saw at the very bottom, kind of on the bottom panel, that were very different mm -hmm. from each other. Um, those, that set of Promethea um, is really sad. We had those in culture uh, in collaboration with the group of Norwich for almost 12 years. That's what we're able to do, do some mating, also mating, um, mating under their conditions or under ours. We did yeah, so that's why I'm a little bit reticent about the conclusions that are drawn from these kinds of studies. But, but we were we able to do transmission experiments with those. This was a collaboration with um, Peter Mark, who in bed for years, and he did some really nice work on his work. People stayed as a mess, you I mean, as a young. And uh, really, it's a nice comparative stuff. And then, and then we illustrious uh, administrators in the U.S. and in Europe decided that that sort of research was out the window and had to go to molecular post-parasite interactions and um, vector conditions and the biology was shut down and all these are not good. So that's the only set of colonies that's ever been mm -hmm. together in one place and that's also set in that very first um, lens. Yes. In the article, we can find with the white flag killing resistance in the plant, right? Say again. In the article, the mm -hmm. crops. So, I have to control to control the white flag, the sensitivity is. Get resistance in the plant. Get resistance. Make resistance. Make the plant resistant to the virus. Genetic resistance to ah, yeah. white virus. Yes. White virus. Resistance to the yeah. white virus. To the bee. If you get white virus. Yeah. Oh, to control yeah. virus. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I mean, if it's possible to develop resistance, it's not. It's been pretty challenging mm -hmm. to develop resistance. There's resistance to to a few, to tomato yellow beef curl, for example, in tomato. There's um, transgenic resistance to being uh, the Colum uh, for the Brazilian bean golden. Um, there's some genetic resistance to being golden in the Caribbean. And there's there's some other around, but it, it's it's taking quite a uh, quite quite a, a long time to develop it because the the viruses have fairly broad, they have very broad host ranges as well. So the white flies can sort of drive the host range of the virus. Right? Usually it's less complex than, than the white fly host range, but it's still so the viruses can get into the same sort of mixtures in the same plant, and they can recombine and shuffle their sequences. They can overcome resistance that way. So it, you know, it's this ongoing mm -hmm. uh, battle being fought by 
the breeders. And it takes, what, about 20 years to develop resistance, and it takes a virus a few generations to break it down. So it's, it's been a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Did you just go uh, what little question? Yeah. You mentioned about the outbreaks come and go uh, like twice, mainly with uh, the media. Uh, like uh, right now, basically, we are going to go off and then possibly they are associated with that. And this is the dry season. Uh, also, tropical, so tropical uh, problems mostly. And uh, we have, as you noticed, like, uh, like the movement or uh, the new areas, for example. Moving up north, those climate changes associated yeah, with actually, yeah, um, some phenomena. Can, 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 how, what, what is the future for white flies and white flies experts that we are cultivating here? It is a real, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of work to, to do with white flies. Is it going? Well, I think, why, I think white flies are so adaptable that you know, they're not going anywhere. But 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 I think there is evidence that they shift depending mm -hmm. on the on the temperature. Interesting. So you know the bee biotype is a problem when it's so invasive, and it's you mm -hmm. should see these up at least see these upsurges when it comes to these new areas. And uh, now that there's insecticides to control, you can. I hear so much about it, but it's mm -hmm. losing in the cloak, it really definitely has to use problems and virus transmission. And, and well, the bee biotype is, is sort of an anomaly because it actually is so um, such a pest, it, so much pressure on, on the host because of the high numbers and the feeding damage mm -hmm. that um, really before I'm going to cloak it this down to control to that, to control it, we don't have to worry about viruses. Pressure alone to kill the science. Now that we have pesticide, we can keep those numbers down. We start seeing viruses and keep back the problems. Um, when you have, when you have a bee, it loves hot, arid, dry areas and monoculture. But the typical cycle of the pandemic in Tabassies is to follow the, you know, after the rain, the flesh grow from the plants, reproduce, going into the dry. And here the white behavior of these is sort of just like the area of bay type in Arizona, so it's written between plants where the bee biotype sort of gets up like a herd block in the middle of flies. So that's probably an adaptation from the um, Middle East right? mm -hmm. and looking for So yeah, yeah, different behaviors as well. Um, and that's going to come into play when you start seeing changes in you know, due to temperature and rainfall shifts and like that. And they're going to follow the plants. In Guatemala, we were following for about 15 years the uh, you know, basket there. The bee, the bee was in one of the couple of the valleys, the endemics were still in the areas of the more humid, a little bit higher up. And what we saw in the last five years is a shift where the trial rodents and greenhouse are actually coming down. Uh, into fields, which is quite the opposite of what we would have expected. It's mm -hmm. cooler, we thought it were cooler um, highlands. But um, in Nicaragua, you see the Tabasi in the highland, and you see the Honduras in the highland. But, I don't know. but the Triarori is actually displaced in this season, the lowlands, and some of the vegetable areas. Mm -hmm. Quite surprising. So, I mean, I think we don't know what's you know, mm -hmm. the outcome. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going to be a matter of Studying the class, what factors really are coming to play there. More complex than just me. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone.